Please remain standing for reading of God's Word this morning. Our text is found on 1 John 1, 5-10. to Indeed, the message which we have heard from Him and which we proclaim to you is this, namely, God is light and there is no darkness in Him at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and all, all we walk in darkness, then we lie and do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship with Him and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from, from all sin. If we say we have no sin and we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, then He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, then we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord God, uh, how good... And how pleasant it is to be together this morning, Lord, in, as one body of believers, Lord, as in one spirit, one God, one goal, Lord, one fellowship, Lord, we, Lord, this is our desire this morning. In your word said, in you alone we move and live and have our being. Psalm 16, you made known to us the path of light. Lord, in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand and pleasure forevermore. Lord, this morning we confess, Lord, as, as the deer panted for the water, so our soul longs for you, Lord. Lord, we are just one bunch of people here. Lord, um, uh, Stand, standing in awe, in wonder, in worship of your, what you have done, what you have accomplished of the cross 2,000 years ago. Lord, we are thankful and grateful with humble gratitude. Lord, we give thanks to you for the light that you have shown upon us, Lord, through, Lord, to your, the light of the gospel that you have opened our eyes, Lord. Lord, that uh, to see the light of the gospel, the glory of your Son, Jesus, Lord. Uh, this is, uh, Lord, this is our joy now. This is our desire. This is our delight now, Lord, to know you and to know you in your death and your suffering, Lord. Lord, this is our light now. You've called us into this path, Lord. So help us, Lord, to live a life now that is pleasing before you, Lord, that uh, give us a heart, Lord, to uh, love you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, because the strength, Lord, to follow your command, Lord, could never come from us, Lord. It's only by your spirit, Lord. So help us, Lord, to magnify your name, Lord, every day, Lord. And uh, Lord, we uh, thank you, Lord, for this body of believers, Lord. Um, Lord, we uh, lift up to you our cares and our worries, Lord. Um, we, uh, Lord, you are our Heavenly Fathers, Lord, who cares for your people. So we just cast all our cares upon you, our anxiety and worries and stress, Lord. For we know that you are, uh, Lord, um, a generous God, that you who did not spare your own son, but gave him up for us all, how will you not also with him graciously give us all things, Lord? So we thank you, Lord. Uh, this is our joy and our strength in life, Lord. And uh, Lord, we pray for the preaching of your word now this morning. We thank you for Pastor Joel, for his uh, uh, leadership for this church, Lord, and we pray that you will uh, your spirit will be upon him this morning, Lord, that we will see your beauty, your truth, your light, your glory through the preaching of your word this morning, and that, Lord, we will, by hearing of your word, Lord, we will, uh, it will produce and accomplish what you have meant for it to accomplish, Lord. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Good morning, Praise Church. What a joy and a delight as people are just trickling in. I don't know if it's the, the Lunar New Year where people have stayed up and not at church this morning, but we praise God for you that He has brought you here to worship with us. And uh, I'm sure many of us woke up to the horrible news of the massacre in uh, Monterey Park where 10 people were brutally murdered. So let's keep... Uh, the families there in our prayer and that somehow through the death and the darkness the life of Christ would be lifted up and his the light of the gospel would uh, bring about a calling attention to hope beyond the grave and the ugliness of sin has definitely taken root of creation yet there's hope and Christ has defeated sin, and though we live in a fallen world yet, uh, we are not under the futility of sin, but we are being transformed from glory to glory. And uh, our church is going through the letter of John, and this morning we're going to specifically focus in verse 8 of this main corpus in verses 5 to 10. The divine indicative that God is light compels a human moral imperative without exemption. Because God is light, John tells us, therefore, everyone ought to walk in the light because we are created in God's image. So all human beings created in God's image must walk in the light. No one can say, I'm good. Walking in the light is not for me. No human can say that God is light does not apply to me because I already walk in the light perfectly. I don't need forgiveness of sin through Jesus. To even have the inkling to entertain such a thought, or at worst actually say it out loud, is delusional. And for John, it is not just delusional, it is deception. And furthermore, such a deception indicates that one does not walk in the truth. Walking in the light, as we have learned, involves practicing righteousness as God is righteous. Yet, as we shall discover this morning, practicing righteousness does not happen under the guise of perfection. There is still room for sinning. So it's not perfection overnight, but progression over a lifetime. Thus, the title to this morning's sermon is Walking in the Light, Yet Still Giving Room or progression of obedience, not perfection. To review, let's remember how our passage fits together so that we don't misinterpret what's going on. So let's follow the logic of our passage in verse 5. John gives a summary statement, God is light and in Him there is no darkness, which means that God is categorically upright and moral. Now what does it mean? So we have the divine indicative, we have the human imperative. The implication that God is light means that we have to walk in the light of God. We have to reflect God's character, righteousness, faith, hope, love. You've got to do that. That's God's image bearers. As we have learned, you've got to be born again to do this. You need the Spirit of God. And just in case there's some misconceptions of what it means to walk in the light, because this can happen, John gives two explanations, one negative and one positive. The negative explanation is this. Walking in the light does not mean that we have no need for forgiveness of sin anymore, or we have never sinned. When you say that, you implicate yourself as deceived, and you implicate God as a liar. So I know that there's a group of Christians who think that you can achieve moral perfection here on earth. The Wesleyans believe this. But I don't think John would agree with them. And yet there's a positive explanation. Instead, walking in the light means that through the process of our sinning, progressing morally, we confess our sins. And once we do that, we implicate God as righteous, and we implicate ourselves as being cleansed from our unrighteousness. So walking in the light then is not perfection, as I say again, 
but in perfect progression of obedience to conform to God's righteousness. Walking the light does not mean that you never sin or that you have no need for forgiveness of sin. And that is the first explanation that John gives in verses 7 to 8. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, God is in the light, then we have fellowship with God and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. This is the third, I think, if I count correctly, hypothetical statement. If we say we have no sin, then, the if-then statement, right? Then first it means we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. To walk in the light in verse 7 is defined in verse 8. What does it mean to walk in the light? In verse 8, it means you still sin. Because you can't say we have no sin. Such a verb and a direct object, have no sin, is unique to John. Indeed, if you look up the usage of have no sin elsewhere in the Bible, it doesn't occur in the Greek Old Testament, it doesn't occur anywhere else, it occurs only to John in John's Gospel four times. For instance, in John chapter 9, verse 41, and by looking it up, I think we're going to get an understanding, and I'm going to propose to you what it means to, that, to say that you have no sin. I think it means you have no need for the forgiveness of sin that comes through Jesus. I think that's the meaning, based on its usage four times in the Gospel of John. But we'll just look at one, because they're all going to be the same pattern. And Jesus said to them, if you're blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, we see, your sins remain. Well, the chapter of John in chapter 9 begins with Jesus walking on Sabbath, and he sees a blind man. And the disciples ask a theological question. Lord Jesus, who sinned so that this man is born blind? Is it his parents? Or did this guy sin? And Jesus answered, neither. Of course, directly, it was not the parent's sin that caused this child to be born blind, but rather, on the other hand, indirectly, right? We live in a fallen world and people are born blind as part of the curse of sin. The world is under the futility of sin, Romans chapters 1 to 3. And we know this because we see the horror and the evil and the, and the atrocities we hear, we see, we witness every day. The world is under the futility of sin. So on the one hand, neither directly, but indirectly, of course, we live in a fallen world. And in order to demonstrate that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus famously spits at the ground and once he spits at the ground he makes mud so that's a big wad of spit right it's not just a little spit he must have had a pretty considerable amount of spit he gets the ground he makes mud he rubs it on the eye of the blind person i think most commentators see an illusion back to Genesis chapters 1 to 2. When God formed the ground and he breathed life. So this is new creation language. And so he rubs it on the eye of the blind man and he told him to go to the fountain and wash it out and Jesus leaves. So with spit and mud in his eyes, he goes to this fountain, he washes his eyes, and for the first time in his life since birth, he finally sees. Now, the crowd was shook. Whoa, isn't this the blind guy? And they made a big fuss about it. 
Weren't you just blind this morning? How come you have sight now? Haven't you been born blind since forever? What happened? He says, well, this guy, Jesus, he spat on the ground and, you know, put it on my eye and I washed it. And so they brought the guy to the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders. And they asked the Pharisees, like, what does this mean? And the Pharisees were honestly divided. One group said, well, Jesus can't be from God because he broke the Sabbath. Right, he was walking, he spat on the ground, and, and he healed on the Sabbath. He broke the Sabbath. He can't be from God. And there's another group of Pharisees who say, well, how can someone be from the devil and heal the blind? That's a good point. They were divided. So still not convinced, the Pharisees went to the parents to, to confirm, hey, is it true that your son was born blind? And the parents said, yes, he's been blind since birth. And finally, they still can't get over. How can this be? They asked the guy, what happened to you? And we have the famous phrase, I don't know. The only thing I know is, I once was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, right? How sweet the sound. And they brought the blind guy to Jesus. And Jesus says this. Listen carefully. For judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. I'll say that again. Jesus came into the world so that those who do not see may see, and those who see will become blind. And of course, the Pharisees understood what Jesus was really saying. Are you talking about us? Are you accusing us of seeing when we're in fact blind? Is that what you're saying? And here's Jesus' response in verse 41. And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. Which means what? You're blind. What does it mean to be blind then? Which also means you have no sin. Or your sin remains, rather. What does it mean to be blind? You made a critical, Christological error of judgment. You miscalculated who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. The Lord of the heavens. Whose dominion has no rival. He's the promised king from the seed of David, from the seed of David, and his kingdom is forever. And the Pharisees then, ironically, have physical sight, but spiritual blindness. And the blind guy had physical blindness. But now, he has true sight. He recognized that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, who must die on the cross in obedience to the will of the Father to remove humanity's sin against them. In this way, the Pharisees in their unwillingness to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah who must die on the cross to remove sin, are truly blind despite having physical sight. And we, who are once spiritually blind, 
Jesus has come so that we may see. To have no sin then is to have your sins forgiven through Jesus. And I think that's what's going on here as well in 1 John. God is light, therefore walk in the light. And someone would say, well, I, 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 no, this, that's not for me. I'm good. I'm a good person. I don't need forgiveness of sin. And to use the language of John 9, you're blind, though you have sight. Indeed, the scripture is consistent that no human is without sin. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, Solomon, the wisest man, wisely recognized there's no human who does not sin. Chapter 8, verse 46, when they sin against you, the, I'm using the New American Standard here because they're probably the most literal. Why? Because there's no man who does not sin and thou art angry with them, and thou deliver them to an enemy, so that they take them away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near. Solomon's prayer is like, Lord, when they do sin, Lord, because that's going to happen, eventually please forgive them. Because no human does not sin. Part of the lesson that we learn about Noah's flood in Genesis chapter 6 through 8 is that wiping out practically all of humanity, drowning them, did not wipe out sin with humanity. In Genesis chapter 8 verse 21, and the Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I'll never again curse the ground on account of man. Why? Because the intent of man's heart is evil from youth. God says, there's no point of wiping out the whole world again with judgment. Because God will have to do it again. Why? Because our hearts are bent on sinning since birth. So God says, I will not flood the earth. I will not judge the whole world again in such a catastrophic way. Until the final judgment. And so Noah then becomes the prefigurement of the coming of the return of Jesus. So Noah... The preacher of righteousness, James says. The preacher of righteousness. Because he preached the word of God that the invisible, which is the reign of God's judgment, is coming, but nobody listened. The same way we are preachers of righteousness now. God's judgment is coming. And you need to repent. Though, like Noah's days, right? It was drought. The farthest thing in their mind is rain. And so it is in our day. The farthest thing in people's mind is the judgment of God. It's the farthest thing away. Unless a massacre happens. Unless somebody dies. Then people think about God and his judgment. So the lesson that we learned from Noah's flood is that though God wiped away humanity practically, sin remained pervasive and persistent. Now, the first century Jewish philosopher Philo affirmed the universality and depravity of sin plaguing all humankind. For, for instance, in Philo's writings, Unchangeable, there's no man who is self-sustained has run the course of life from birth to death without stumbling. But in every case, his footsteps have slipped through errors, some voluntary, some involuntary. This sounds like Psalm 19, right? 
Keep back your servants also from presumptuous sins. Sins that I'm not even aware of. Again, in a papyrus fragment, Philo would also write about the fundamental distinction between God and humanity, and that is God does not sin, and humans sin all the time. Perfection and an absence of deficiency are found in God alone, but deficiency and imperfection exist in every man. Alexander Pope, the English poet of the Enlightenment, famously said, everybody knows this, right? To err is human, to forgive is divine. Hence, to deny the depravity of sin in man is as absurd as denying the reality of death. Why? The wages of sin is death. The reason why people die is because people sin. Genesis chapter 2, the Lord tells Adam, on the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall what? Moat, moat in Hebrew. You're going to really, really die. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned. They they partook of the fruit that disobeyed God. Genesis chapter 4, the first genealogy, it says Adam lived this long and he died. Seth lived this long and he died died. Lamech lived this long and he died, 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 died. Why? The wages of sin is death. People die because people sin. To deny that you do not sin, to deny your need for for forgiveness is as absurd as denying that people die. The proof that we are sinners is death. Are you going to contest death? Are you really really that far off in your thinking that you're going to deny that people actually die? So biblically, to deny sin is is in effect denying the reality of death. For John, it's not just absurdity, it is deception. It is deception. As he says in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves. The word to deceive literally means to wander or stray away, which is not exclusive to humans, but in fact occurs many times in the Old Testament, the Septuagint, to refer to animals straying away. For instance, In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 1, you shall not see your countryman's ox or a sheep straying away. That's the same word for deceive. Wandering away. Leaving the flock. Now when the verb occurs figuratively, it refers to a moral and theological drifting from the truth. Especially with consideration to idolatry. Now Moses uses this verb to stray away, to refer exclusively to idolatry in chapter 4, verse 19. And beware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the hosts of heaven, you may be deceived, drawn away, wander away. Like a mindless ox, or a dumb donkey, which, right, Isaiah chapter 1 uses. An ox knows its master. A donkey knows its owner. But my people do not know me. So, idolatry is as much as stupidity as it is for a donkey failing to recognize his master. Because to stray away from the Lord, it's absurd, it's ridiculous. To be deceived then, ultimately, is to think that someone or something is better than our Lord. The King of the universe. Idolatry is putting something or someone greater than God. 
whether it be Baal in the Old Testament or money in America in 2023, whether it be by the trees of the terebinth in the Old Testament or sexual relationships outside of marriage, including premarital marriage or sex or homosexual sexual relationships is idolatry. Whether sacrificing your children to Molech in the Old Testament or committing abortion in America in 2023. Deception, you see, begins with doubting the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus as a sovereign, self-sufficient supplier of our every need. And the idolatry overtones in deception fits well in 1 John. And that's how John ends the letter. Little children, keep yourselves away from idols. If you say you have no sin, you're saying you have no need for Jesus. And if you say you have no need for Jesus, you're committing idolatry. You're deceived. In John, the specific idolatry is the denial of the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord of the nations. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Later in, in chapter 2, John would define truth explicitly to refer to Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ. Verse 21, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know the truth, and because no lie is of the truth, and what is the truth? He explains to us in a negative way. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. That is the truth. And the lie is the denial that Jesus is the Messiah. And this, the denial of Jesus as the Lord of the nations, as having authority over our lives, is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. The lie is the denial of Jesus as the Christ. The truth is the affirmation that Jesus is the Christ. Indeed, any deviation from the confession that Jesus is Lord is the Antichrist. And there is a, a significant interplay between Antichrist and idolatry. In English, we think of anti as against. But in the original language, in Greek 1, one of your prepositions that you're going to learn, maybe in like your fifth, sixth week of Greek, you're going to come up to this word anti. And you're going to think against. But the definition of anti is instead of. Instead of. Substitution. So instead of Jesus, money. Instead of Jesus, career. Instead of Jesus, relationships. Instead of Jesus, sexual immorality. Instead of God, is idolatry. And John says, the truth is not in you. It is not in you. Now let us close with the following challenge. And we can summarize it in three specific statements. The divine indicative that God is light compels a human moral imperative without exemption. And what is that human moral imperative? We've got to walk in the light. Because we are created in God's image as light. Hence, no human can say, I have no need for forgiveness of sin through Jesus. Because all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. To even say such a thing indicates that person to be deceived, idolatry. 
but not practicing the truth, denying that Jesus is the Christ who died on the cross on Good Friday and resurrected on Easter Sunday as the Son of God. And the Lord said unto him, Give me all the nations, and I'll place them under your feet. Sometimes, when there's a good sale of something, though you don't need it, you're tempted to buy it. Because it's a good buy, right? I'm not in the market for a Tesla, but Tesla prices went down 20%. Plus, you get 7,500 tax credit. We don't need a car. We have three at home. But it was tempting. Or Super Bowl Sunday, it's coming. And you know what happens during, during Super Bowl Sunday? You know what the biggest sales are? TVs. TVs. And you look at those 77-inch OLED, 4K, HDR10, right? <laughs> With 240 hertz, HDMI 2.1, right? <laughs> you know, all these little specs. It's like, oh, man. My TV still works. But this one is new and shiny. It's got all the new technology. Mine still works, though. I already have three at home. Do I need another one? The point is, sometimes there are things that occur that may be, or it could very well be, applicable to you or not applicable to you. But when John says God is light, he's not trying to sell you a TV and it doesn't apply to you because you already have one. When John says God is light, he's not advertising a new Tesla, though you have three cars in your household. This could apply to you, this could not apply to you. When John says God is light, no one can say, that's not for me. I'm good. I don't need that. I don't need anyone to die for my sin, because listen, I try not to sin. I'm somewhat of a good person. I don't murder. So long as I don't harm anybody, right? That's how m morality is discussed in popular forums. Like, so long as you don't harm people, then you're morally upright. Have you heard, heard, heard people say that? I'm not harming anyone. You're fine. We're both consenting adults. I'm not harming anyone. When John says God is light, he implicates every human being on earth. Because every human being is created in God's image. And that means you've got to walk in the light. And to say, nope, that's not for me, you're deceived. And the truth is not in you. No human is without sin. The wages of sin is death. What proof do you need that you're a sinner? Forest lawn. Take a visit. You'll be reminded that you're a sinner. And then you'll come, as we shall see next Sunday. You confess your sin. And because Jesus died on the cross as the Son of God and the Son of Man, and because God is righteous, He will forgive you of your sin. And that is what it means to walk in the light. You have forgiveness of sin 
through Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you, created in your image, formed from the same clay as Adam, and marred with the same sin as Adam. There is no unrighteous Lord, no, not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. And so no one can say, I have no need for forgiveness of sin through Jesus. Because every human is a sinner. Remind us this morning that it is in fact that you are the light that necessitated Jesus dying. It means that you're morally upright. You just won't forgive sinners just because. You're holy, you're righteous, you are just. Sin must be punished. It must. And the punishment must be fitting. It must be a perfect, spotless lamb. And the procedure must be fitting. It can't be offered by a high priest who is a sinner himself. And praise be to you, O Lord, that 2,000 years ago you sent us Jesus, the great high priest, who is without sin, and offered himself and poured out his blood not on the mercy seat in the tent of meeting, not in the mercy seat of the Holy of Holies, but he poured out his blood on the heavenly altar, as Hebrews tells us, in your very throne room, so that once and for all there is forgiveness of sin found in Jesus. And so if we can't say we have no need for forgiveness of sin, this morning we say, we confess our sins. We repent and we run and bathe in the blood of Jesus. That his blood cleanses us from all sins. Thereby, we can walk in your light. May you do this, Father, not for our sake, but for your glory's sake. Should there be anyone here this morning whose sins are still not forgiven, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would turn and repent and believe in you. I'm asking all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand and worship.